Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our online service. We're so glad that you could join us for worship this morning. This is week two of our Advent series called Four Story Manger. Today, we're going to open with a call to worship from Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 5. I'll read the part in white, and you can respond with the words in green. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. Today we light the candle for the second Sunday in Advent, which is the candle of peace. As we prepare for the coming of Jesus, we remember that Jesus is our hope, and our peace. The prophet Isaiah foretold long ago, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. John also passed these reassuring words of Jesus on to us in his gospel. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. At this time of year, we wrap ourselves up with so much planning, decorating, shopping, gift giving, partying, and sending that we don't have any time for peace. Let's face it, most of us are not at peace, but rather we can be best described as anxious without hope, especially with the COVID virus in our daily lives. We are so used to looking at other people's souls instead of our own. We have no time, but we need to make time to sit in the dark, sit, in the silence, contemplate the miracle of Christmas, and give thanks for the one life that changed the world. Philippians 4, 6 says, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. John 16, in the world, you will have tribulations. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And probably the best definition of peace is found in Ephesians 2.14. He himself is our peace. Let us pray. Gracious God, grant that we may find peace as we prepare for our Lord's birth. May divisions in ourselves and in our families be peacefully resolved. May there be peace in our cities and in the countries of our world. Help us to see the paths of peace in our lives and then give us the courage to follow them. Lord, let us remember that you only are the giver of lasting peace and that you are always with us. Amen. for a miracle the heart longs for a little bit of hope oh come oh come Emmanuel a child prays for peace on earth and she's calling out from a sea of hurt oh come oh come Emmanuel is 
with the tears of a mother A baby's cry is the sound of love Come down, come down, Emmanuel He is the song for the suffering He is Messiah, the Prince of Peace has come has come Emmanuel Glory to the light of the world Glory to the light of the world Glory to the light We're with Terry Scruggs today. Uh, she is a missionary with Wycliffe Bible Translators. And uh, she's here today to give us a, an update on her mission and her work uh, and how it's been affected this year by COVID and how she's fared uh, this year in general. So Terry, tell us about one or two things that your ministry is engaged in right now. Well, good morning, and thank you, uh, Martin and Mary, for meeting with me and inviting me to speak to uh, your congregation. Wycliffe, as you know, is interested in getting the scriptures out to people all over the world in a language that really speaks to their heart. Work is going on around the world, but of course, with COVID, there are some additional challenges these days, as you can imagine. Most of our members are are here at home instead of uh, work uh, instead of being in their field of service so they're working virtually when they can uh yesterday i i heard a story from southeast asia that was very exciting uh the um the people who are supporting this project and um, training the people who are doing the work are all outside of this country at the moment uh, and so they're they're having to work virtually, and sometimes that works, and sometimes there's just not enough broadband in these very uh, rural areas. So it makes it very difficult. But because there's been a reduced funding, and because the uh, the people who are sort of organizing it have all left, um, the local people are really taking up the challenge and they are saying well look we want the scriptures it's for us 
We are going to continue doing the work, even if we're not getting paid a salary. We are going to continue to do this as long as we can. The local church even has taken up the challenge of, of uh, giving a little bit of their finances, which is, is hard in a rural, small rural church um, with very little income. But they're, they're seeing that it's important for them and they're wanting to be involved. And that, that was really, really encouraging, that story that we heard yesterday. What about the work with the, the Cree project in Canada that you had, uh, were a bit involved with, Terry? Yes, the Cree project is going on, but again, very slowly. Uh, uh, the last report that I read from them, they, they said that, that um, they were waiting for um, a committee of the elders to review some of the, um, the uh, translation work that had been done or some of the other um, make, making decisions about what to do next and, and so on. But these elders are, are so involved in their community in other ways that it's often difficult to get them together. So Terry, what have been some of your personal highlights this year? Well, one of the biggest highlights that I will mention is that I'm no longer really working in the projects department. Um, I've handed that over, um, all my responsibilities over to others. And uh, you can pray for a fellow by the name of Dan, who's taken over the, the Cree, the work that I was doing with the Cree, and he's taking on other responsibilities also. But it's a big learning curve for him. So just remember to be praying for him. Since I'm not working in that department anymore, the um, human resources or people department has asked me to come and do some of the um, administrative detail work that needs to be done so that we can meet the obligations that the government requires of us. You know, it, it, as much as I enjoy this job, I, I am... Um, I am a good fit for this role because I've been around so long and there's not very many of the people whose files I look at that I haven't met sometime. So looking forward to closing out this year and into 2021, um, what things can we be praying about for your ministry? Well, I, I, I am really concerned about this, um, the problem with internet. And, you know, there's just, there's so many people that I know of who say, well, we're trying to connect with our team, but the internet just keeps going down, or we just couldn't reach them today, or whatever. So just the, the whole, um, the whole need for internet. I mean, that, that's what COVID has forced on us. We have to do things virtually, and so uh, we just, we just need good access this way, and I would just, um, yeah, ask you to pray for that, for, for these rural communities, especially where people are trying desperately to get God's word into their language. We pray for new people to come and join us in this organization. So Terry, is there anything else you would like to say to the congregation here at Oak Park Church? Well, I, I really appreciate that you're interested in the work of Bible translation. I I just think it is so important that we have God's word in a language that we can read and understand for ourselves, or not just read, but the, uh, putting the scriptures on these SD cards is also happening all over the world, and that's another technological advance that we are taking advance, advantage of these days, and, and uh, just uh, being, in, being involved as you are. And, and being interested in, in what I do, I hope that someday I can come back to your building and see you all face to face again. <laughs>
There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace, in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Well, welcome once again to our online service for December 6th. It's great to have you with us. Thank you for everyone who's been a part of this service, for Paul and Yvonne, for Julie for reading our passage, for Shelley for welcoming us today and singing for us as well. Uh, you may have recognized part of this passage because uh, I sent out a devotional in the weekly email this week, and um, in that devotional on Tuesday, I believe, we read part of the passage that Julie read for us this morning, and you'll recognize this sort of hauntingly beautiful, epic, deep, moving, complex, mystifying, uh, mysterious, confoundingly rich passage. Uh, one of the richest, I think, in the entire uh, Scripture, all the Old and New Testament. Uh, I really think, and I'm not exaggerating here, but I really think that I could probably preach an entire year's worth of Sundays just from these 18 verses at the beginning of the Gospel of John. And don't worry, I'm not tempted to sort of cram all of those into this Sunday's service. But it is, uh, it is a passage that we will certainly not plumb the depths of this morning. We're just going to take a few things out of it and reflect on for our Advent series. Let's begin with a word of prayer. God, you are good. Your faithfulness endures forever. We feel your love in so many different ways. We know that this season, as we uh, mark the journey toward the cradle, we are also marking the journey toward your second coming too. And so we keep those things in mind as we read these introductions to the four Gospels that you have given us in your Scripture. This morning, may your word be heard and may your word be spoken through your Spirit. Amen. Well, I'd like to do something a little different this morning. It doesn't work great for an online service, I'll give you that, but uh, it works a little better in person, but we're going to play a little game, okay? And so this game is called Explaining Movie Plots Badly, all right? I'm going to read you uh, some tweets I found of Explaining Movie Plots Badly, and I'm going to give you just a few seconds to try to guess what the movie is, all right? And so I'll obviously tell you after a few seconds. Okay, so... The first one, this should be, this is a little like a softball one, all right? You should be able to get this one pretty quick. Uh, group spends nine hours returning jewelry. Group spends nine hours returning jewelry. Maybe it's easy for me because it's some of my favorite movies. This is, of course, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, right? That's the plot of the Lord of the Rings trilogy explained badly, that a group Spends nine hours returning jewelry. Okay, you got the hang of it now. We're going to go a little quicker with these ones. Number two, everyone tries the ice bucket challenge. Everyone tries the ice bucket challenge. You get it? The Titanic, of course. Uh, groan, moan, yes, all right. Okay, number three. Um, I just watched this one with my kids the other day. A guy learns to love a girl without her Instagram filters. 
feel like this could actually be used for a lot of different movies, to be honest. A guy learns to love a girl without her Instagram filters. Shrek, of course. Shrek. Shrek 1, obviously. All right, a couple more. Uh, Man-child learns to be an adult. I laughed really hard at this one, actually. Man-child learns to be an adult. This is, in fact, every single Adam Sandler movie. (laughs) I tried to get them all in one image on the screen for you there. All right, final one. Bullied kid with birth defect proves people are only nice to you when they need something. It's a bit of a mouthful. Bullied kid with birth defect proves people are only nice to you when they need something. Anything? Well, how about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? Nothing like depressing you just to start Advent off, right? Making fun of Christmas movies. All right, so what are we doing? Why are we talking about explaining movie plots badly? Well, I want to suggest to you this morning that John's prologue, his introduction, this passage that we read this morning, John 1, 1 to 18, is actually sort of like this, but in a, in a very different way. I want to suggest to you that it's, it's really explaining everything, all of creation, the whole story from creation to redemption, but not badly. I'm going to suggest that it's explaining it goodly. <laughs> and yes, that is a word. It's explaining everything in the world in these short 18 verses, and it's doing it wonderfully, beautifully, powerfully in this poem. All right, let's talk a little bit about John. Let's give you a little introduction to the Gospel of John. Well, like Mark, uh, John is thought to have been written to primarily a non-Jewish audience. It's thought to be probably the last gospel that was written, and it's written probably to mostly a Roman audience. But unlike Mark, (laughs) unlike Mark, it is not the shortest of the gospels, and it's not this action-packed gospel. It's actually full of dialogue and full of monologue and sermons and words. It uses all of the words, actually. All of the words are in the gospel of John. I told the in-person service last week that Mark was, uh, if your favorite Christmas movie was Die Hard, then Mark might be your favorite gospel. Well, if your favorite Christmas movie is like Miracle on 34th Street, then John might be your favorite gospel. And I don't know, I've never seen Miracle on 34th Street, so maybe that's not the greatest example. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, John actually is my favorite gospel. It's this beautiful, uh, very different gospel from all the others. In fact, it shares the least in common with the other three gospels. The other three gospels, we actually have a name for them. We often call them the synoptics, seeing with. They carry the same storyline together. John has almost an entirely (coughs) different, excuse me, (coughs) storyline. And it's very... um, it's very different from the synoptics. There's only three episodes in the, in the whole four Gospels that are shared across all four. Uh, one is the anointing of Jesus, whether his, his feet or his head with perfume or oil, beautiful oil. One is the, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And the third, of course, is the crucifixion, the death of Jesus himself. And so these are the only three things that are shared with across all of these Gospels. Let's talk a little bit about but the writer of the gospel. It is, in fact, John. Uh, we have a few Johns in the early church, so it's helpful to, to clarify them here. We talked about John the Baptist this week. The writer of the gospel of John is sometimes called John the Evangelist or sometimes called John the Theologian. He was, in fact, one of the three inner circle of Jesus' disciples, along with his brother James and Peter. They were the the closest disciples with Jesus. Now, there's an interesting thing in the Gospel of John in that uh, John, his name, doesn't actually appear. Not once do we hear about the apostle or the disciple John with James and Peter and with the rest. So why is this? Well, most scholars think that this is actually further proof that it was John the Evangelist or John the Apostle who's writing this gospel because he's writing himself out of it. Uh, It's sort of a a humble or self-effacing way to say, look, this story isn't about me. It's about Jesus. Now, 
we do encounter an apostle, a follower of Jesus, that is referred to as the one whom Jesus loved, or Jesus' beloved disciple. Now, that sort of seems uh, maybe a little arrogant to us if we think that John is referring to himself in these circumstances. Uh, but I actually think, I, I read it a very different way. He's not sort of placing himself above the other disciples saying, I was the one that Jesus loved more than all the others. He, he's saying, I was not worthy of this love from Jesus, and yet he loved me even yet still. So that's probably the instances of where John is in the gospel. He is uh, one of the sons of Zebedee. He wrote uh, three letters, beautiful letters, right near the end of the New Testament, near the end of the whole Bible. And he's the author of the Apocalypse at the end, or, or the book of Revelation that we preached on last year. Um, so he's written a lot of the material in the New Testament. And it all has this very similar sort of poetic, epic feel to it. All right, a couple more things. Uh, you may notice in, in the painting that I've put up of the Gospel of John that he's not a hipster like John the Baptist because he has no epic beard. He's just got kind of that five o'clock shadow thing going on. But he certainly does love his deep VTs, right? I mean, that's kind of hipsterish too. And like the feather pen, that's a little bit hipsterish too. So maybe he's not that different from John the Baptist. But there's something lurking in the background of that picture, something I didn't talk about last week at all that I thought I would highlight this week. If you can see it in the painting, it's a little bit creepy. It's, it's actually a bird. And if you look closely, you can tell that, that it's, it's an eagle of some kind. And so uh, the church, for more than a thousand years, has always so had uh, something that they've called the tetramorph. And no, it's not a new Power Ranger. The tetramorph is images that are associated with the evangelists, with the writers of the gospel, and in fact, with the gospels themselves. And if you want to do some background digging on this, you can. They're, they're actually creatures that were around the throne of, um, of the king, of, of the king of heaven in Ezekiel, this prophetic text, text in the Old Testament where we learn that these creatures are sort of the, the closest beings around the throne. And so the church has taken these and applied each of them to one of the Gospels. And so you may have seen this before. You may not have thought anything of it, or you may have wondered what it was all about, and this is what it's about. And, and so uh, the Gospel of Matthew is represented by a man, by a human, right? And by the way, they all have wings because they're all sort of these divine, angelic representations, too, around the throne of Yahweh. Uh, the Gospel of Mark that we looked at last week is often represented by a lion. And so if you've traveled to Venice, their sort of uh, city symbol is the lion because that's supposedly the, the last resting place of St. Mark. If you go to St. Mark's Square, you'll see on a large pillar in the middle this winged lion. And that's because the symbol or the icon, think icon like on your computer, you know those little things you click and they open up something bigger? That's exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, Luke gets the unfortunate one. Luke is an ox, kind of ugly, but that's all right. It's a winged ox. Those must be pretty strong wings, I guess. And, and the Gospel of John gets the eagle, the bird, right? Now, there is a reason for me sort of telling you all this background. It's not just fun facts this morning. It's a part of my segue. Why did John get the eagle in the tetramorph? Why, why did they think that that was appropriate? Well, there's sort of two competing claims in the history of the church as to why the eagle gets applied to John. The first is this. Uh, eagles were thought, and I can't disprove this. Maybe it's true. I don't know. Eagles were thought to have been able to look directly at the sun. And so uh, this idea that John often talked about the sun and the radiance of the sun, the brightness of the sun, something we're going to focus on here this morning, is, is applied to him as the eagle, the one who could talk directly about the sun. And the second reason is simply the lofty heights that it, an eagle could fly to. And again, it goes with sort of this poetic language in the Gospel of John that it could fly so high to these beautiful heights that no other gospel could. All right, 
So that's sort of my segue into talking about last week, what did we focus on? We focused on foundations. We focused on basements, right? We focused on that, that floor that provides a firm foundation for the life of Christ, yes, but also for our lives. And this week we're going right up to the top, and we're talking about attics, or we're talking about lofts of some kind, right? We're talking about that top floor in our four-story manger. Uh, you'll notice, as Julie read our passage this morning, that John's prologue, his introduction, is not linear in any way. So the synoptic gospels, they like to tell stories. They like to have narrative, right? Uh, John's gospel is not like that. And, and again, I'm going to use the word poem. It's, it's this epic poem, and I'm going to borrow a phrase and, and name the poem, The Immense Descent. The immense descent. That's what it's about. And you'll see on the screen, I've, I've put an image of this sort of upside down triangle. Because that's how I picture what John is doing in his prologue here. This is the poem that he's telling us. He's telling us about how grand and how great and how big and how powerful and how sovereign this one is. Bigger than the whole world. Creator of everything that we know. And yet he has come down in this tiny little point breaking into our created world in the, in the smallest, most helpless kind of way. So we have the grandeur of God at the beginning, and that's breaking in to He was made flesh and dwelt among us. One commentator talking about the, the prologue of the Gospel of John says, you know, it's, it's a little bit like one of those long, winding country roads as you drive up to this sort of grand estate. That's what the, the road is like, the prologue. And another commentator says, it's like entering into sort of a, a palatial home, a big mansion, and those grand foyers. And how beautiful and, and sort of awesome those grand foyers are. But I, I'm going to stick with our image, our metaphor for this series, and I'm going to say it's a little bit like climbing a spiral staircase to a hidden room, a part of the attic that's, that's been turned into this sort of secret hideaway, this, this getaway that we can go into. Uh, a few years ago, when we were still living in Toronto, uh, we met my brother and his family in Quebec City for a little holiday. And we didn't want to uh, do the hotel thing, we didn't want to stay in Quebec, so we found this Airbnb outside of the city in the countryside of, of old Quebec. And it was actually, we didn't realize this till we sort of got there, but it was actually an old barn uh, that they had converted to this Airbnb. And it was beautiful. They had done this great sort of rustic chic job and you go in, it's all open and the kitchen's open and it's one big space and the kids could run around and have fun and play. But the best part of this barn was at the back of the barn, there was this narrow little staircase that you could go up and actually, that's where all of the beds were. When you got into the loft, it opened up, and it had this peak. The peak was probably 15 feet up, and it was spacious, and there was these giant windows at either end that brought in all this light, and there was toy chests, and there was different areas, and it was such a beautiful loft. And that's, that's sort of what's been in my mind as I've been thinking about the prologue of the Gospel of John as this, this attic or this loft, this highest feature in the four-story manger. C.S. Lewis, in his, his final book in the Chronicles of Narnia, The Last Battle, as the children and the last king of Narnia, Tyrion, and they're, they're in a dark place. The battle is going on, and frankly, they're, they're losing. And they're backed into a corner, and they're sort of backed up this hill, and they find this, this little shed, this little stable, animal barn, at the top of this hill, almost like an attic or a loft. And they have to squeeze in there to hide from the forces that are coming on. And So I want, I want to read you just a little bit here. It says they squeeze into the small space, and they, they find that it opens up into a, an entirely new and airy and bright and beautiful place. Tyrion looked round again, could hardly believe his eyes. There was blue sky overhead and grassy country spreading as far as he could see in every direction and his new friends all around him laughing. It seems then, said Tyrion, smiling himself, that the stable seen from within 
and the stable seen from without are two different places. Yes, said Lord Diggory. Its inside is bigger than its outside. Yes, said Queen Lucy. In our world too, a stable once had something inside that was bigger than our whole world. Friends, this is the image of the nativity in the Gospel of John. This is the prologue of John's Gospel. This immense descent. The bigness, the grandeur of God come down to this tiny little point. Seemingly insignificant in our world. It's the story of the whole world. It's the retelling of the cosmic story of God and His creation and His redemption of that creation. All told in 18 short verses at the beginning of John's Gospel. I want to unpack it this morning. But again, there's too much to fully unpack. So I want to unpack it with just three words. Three words that that John uses. And I want to try to retell the story myself. Again, last week we focused on on the basement foundation of this four-story manger and the role that John the Baptist played in preparing the way. He was the sign outside. He He was the arrow pointing toward what was to come, right? Well, John the evangelist or John the theologian doesn't ignore John the Baptist either. He's in all four Gospels. And so I want you to hear again this morning what John the evangelist says about John the Baptist. He says, He's the the one who comes after me, ranks above me because he was before me. Let me break that down for you again. The one who comes after me, my successor, ranks above me, my superior. Why? Because he was actually before me. He was my predecessor. The successor of John the Baptist is his superior because he was actually, in fact, his predecessor. It's like John the theologian is saying, look, John the Baptist may be or may have been the voice, but Jesus is the Word. That's the first word I want us to talk about this morning. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Verse 1 and 2 of our passage. Well, what in the world does that mean, right? Poetry is not easy to understand. It's complex. It's layered. There's there's context. We have to sort of uh, peel back the layers to understand what's being talked about. And, And if we don't have some understanding of what John is referring to when he says the word here, we're actually not going to get very much of the prologue at all. And there's a ton of context here. There's books upon books upon books that are written about what exactly John is doing here. The word in the Greek that he uses is logos. You've probably heard that word before. It's it's sort of a common transliteration word that we use in our language. It literally means word. But of course, there's different words for word in the Greek. And this has a lot of background. And some people would even say it has a lot of baggage with it. I'm not going to pretend to cover all of that this morning. I'm going to give you sort of three sources of what I think John is riffing off. What what I think he is borrowing and using when he uses this term logos. In the beginning was the logos. And the logos was with God and the logos was God. The logos was with God in the beginning. The first is this. Uh, In Greek philosophy, for for hundreds of years before John, in, in fact, specifically in Stoic Greek philosophy. If you know Marcus Aurelius the emperor, then you know that he was a a Stoic philosopher, very common around the time of of Jesus and the early church. Uh, This idea of the Logos was, um, well to say it was central is probably not giving its due justice. It it was uh, foundational. It was fundamental in understanding Stoic philosophy. It had this, this idea of sort of being the, the very orderly rationality of the whole world. So if someone were to ask, what holds the world together? How, what, what keeps it hung in such a, a beautiful, you know, sort of precarious balance? Well, it's the Logos. The Logos is the rationality, it's the ordering of all things, all of creation, all of the cosmos itself holding it together, sustaining it. That's the Logos. And and without a doubt, 
John knows this. He's aware of this background and he uses it. He is, he is absolutely saying, yes, that's what I'm talking about. Another source, uh, Jewish philosophy itself. Philo of Alexandria, Jewish philosopher, writing around the time of Jesus, um, is, is using the same concept. And he's sort of trying to weave together Greek philosophy and, and Jewish philosophy and Jewish scripture itself. And here he, he sort of relies on this idea that the Logos and uh, wisdom, when it's talked about in the Old Testament, Sophia is the word, uh, these are, these are the same things. That the wisdom of God is sort of personified as the Word of God. And John is saying, yes, that's what I'm talking about too. <laughs> I'm using that. Right? And the third thing, and, and more and more scholars are realizing that, that John is, is simply sort of commentating on the Old Testament himself. He's, he's using the Scripture, the Hebrew Scriptures of the Old Testament and he's saying, we already have this idea. We know this. We don't have to borrow it all from the Greeks. We don't have to sort of merge philosophies together. This is Scripture itself. And so I want to read for you Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. I think it is the, sort of the clearest uh, example. I'm not going to read it, actually. I'm just going to sort of paraphrase it. It says, look, this is God speaking through Isaiah, through the prophet. He says, as the rain and the snow go out, what happens, right? Well, they don't return to the heavens without doing anything. No, they're effective, right? He says they they nourish the earth. They make it bud. They make it flower. They make it flourish. They make uh, huge yields from their nourishment. He says it's the same thing. So too, my word goes out from my mouth, but it does not return to me empty. It accomplishes what it was sent to do. So too my word that goes out from my mouth. You see, the word in John is Jesus. Jesus has come in the flesh. That's what this immense descent is. It's the story of this great God becoming like you and I. In the flesh. Human. Fully human. And that's what's going on here. That God is sending His Son. Sending the word into the world. And it will, he will, accomplish what he is sent for. If you want a, a sort of analogy or illustration here, um, this is one that I found helpful over years. Uh, the word that is talked about at the start of John's Gospel is a little bit like uh, the difference and the similarity between our audible words and our inaudible thoughts. The, the, the way our audible words relate to our inaudible thoughts is very same way that the Word of God, Jesus, relates to God the Father Himself. I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are thinking, uh, well, the the audible words I have and the inaudible thoughts I have are exactly the same. I have no filter. Yes, we've been meaning to talk to you about that. There's some issues there. (laughs) Some of you realize that if you're like me and you talk to yourself, you know that the more you talk audibly, out loud, the more you sort of even understand yourself. And the, certainly, the more you are revealing to the one that you're talking to, right? And so these, the point is that, that these things, of course, all analogies, no analogy is perfect here, but, but the analogy is that these things are intimately connected, right? Our audible words and our inaudible thoughts. But even though they share the sort of same essence, They're from the same source. They're from the same same sort of being. They're not the same thing exactly. There's a a distinction. There's a difference here. And so the the word, it says, creates and it communicates. Just like our words, by the way. Our words uh, reveal to others, uh, sometimes to ourselves, like I said, if you're used to talking to yourself, what is hidden within us. Right? Right? But they don't just communicate, they can actually create realities too. And, and this is not something we, we think about or talk about a lot, but they can in very concrete ways. So I sometimes get the opportunity as a minister of the gospel to say things like, I now pronounce you husband and wife. My words have created a new reality. Or another one, if you're a police officer, you can say, you are under arrest. A judge says, I sentence you too, right? These are realities that our words can create. Our family ministries pastor, Sarah, and her husband Matt, 
had this very unique opportunity this past week as they were uh, adopting a little baby girl. And they were able to say, your name is Alexa Christine Eglin. We're all just a little excited about that right now. How about that for a birth announcement? And this is the same way that, that God's Word creates and then communicates God's very self to us, right? And we have a a very fancy sort of party word for this. We call it accommodation. But it's a word that we're sort of familiar with. In fact, it's a a word that fits with a four-story manger idea, right? This grand house, accommodation. The the way I explain things to my kids is sometimes accommodating, right? I have to sort of bring it down to a level that they can understand. Bring it down to an appropriateness, right? Like when they're asking questions about how exactly Isla, our youngest daughter, came about. Well, I use accommodating language for that because it's appropriate, right? And so God has spoken to us in the most human way possible. How? By this immense descent. By becoming human himself. By revealing himself to us. And so what does this revelation of God's Word tell us? Well, it says this, when? In the beginning. There's this direct echo to the book of Genesis, the first book of the Old Testament, that before anything was created, the Word was there. In the beginning, when? The Word was with God. That's where the Word was. When and where. The Word was God. That's who the Word is. And then verse 2 is a summary. He was with God in the beginning. With God and is God. Somehow we have this, this grand, great mystery of this one who is both with God and is God. The same and different. And, and theologians and Christians for two millennia have been trying to sort out exactly how this is the case. And there's been uh, debates and disputes over this. And there has been significant people sort of try to explain it in different ways. This can't be the case. It can't be with God and God, right? It can't be different and the same. And so uh, right back from, from the Arians of the 2nd and 3rd and 4th centuries, right to today with Jehovah Witnesses, right? There is this pushback against this idea of being, yes, with God and God. It has been a major stumbling block. And of course, John 1, the prologue here, the very first couple verses have been at the center of that debate. And so if if you've ever been in dialogue, in discussion with some of these groups, especially something like Jehovah Witnesses, they might say, well, uh, Jesus might be a sort of divine being or a demigod, a semigod, a sort of God or created after God. He certainly wasn't with God in the beginning. But that's exactly what John says. We have to uphold exactly what is said in this gospel. And, and if they argue with you further, I, really, really quickly, this is a, just a really simple thing you can say to them. You could just say, look, in Greek syntax, the, the definite predicate, sorry, the definite nominative predicate noun that precedes a finite verb is always an arthros, all right? So uh, that should just clear everything up for both of you, and it should be just perfectly straightforward, right? All right, well, it'll at least confuse you enough or them enough that the conversation will probably be over. Well, listen, if, if I've lost you along the way here, I, I know it gets into some sort of bog-like stuff, right? It's hard to trudge through this stuff. Some of, sometimes our eyes sort of glaze over and we think, what are we talking about? Why does this matter? It matters so intensely in the Gospel of John. It matters so deeply. In fact, I think this is sort of the bedrock upon which the whole prologue is built. The whole gospel of John is built because he is saying what? He is saying this word, this one who is the one who comes in the descent is fully divine. Is fully God. There's no way around that. And that's what I want us to take from that first word. Word. Logos. The second word this morning is light. Light. In him was life, and that life was the light of all humankind. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it or understood it, right? And then in verse 9, the true light that enlightens all humanity was coming into the world. 
this theme of light, this image of light is woven through the prologue itself. The, the light in the loft, in the attic, often catches the last little bit of that light. The, the fourth floor, there was actually an apartment in the attic in the building we lived in. It was on the fourth floor. And you would climb this, this sort of spiral staircase and you would go directly into the apartment. And there was this beautiful old office sort of right at the entrance. And it had this porthole window facing west, directly west. And it would catch just the last bit of light. Nowhere else in the building had sunlight except that little office in the attic. It was the last bit. And so there's no uh, light of a star that's guiding shepherds or magi to the stable in the Gospel of John. The, the light itself is the word that has come in his descent to become flesh. The entrance into the world. God is light. Darkness in the Gospel of John is the absence of God's being. The brightness of true light is God himself. We read this in our call to worship last Sunday. If you remember, again, from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And so in verse 3 to 5 here, we learn that the Word is not only divine as an agent in the world as creation, right? In the beginning it was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, he was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made, right? And so we learn that He is the agent of all creation, but now as He turns to life and light, we understand that He too is actually the agent of redemption of salvation, not just creation. You see, he comes to bring life. And life here for, for John is not bios, right? Biology, right? It's zoe. Life abundant. New life. Life fulfilled. A second life. After already creating life once, all of life, John begins to tell us that it, here in verse 3 that this is also what will happen with new life? In chapter 3, we're going to meet someone named Nicodemus in John's Gospel. And Jesus will tell him what? You need to be born again. Born again. That's the life that we're talking about in verse 3. The life, this new life, this redeemed life comes through what? Through the light. Because the light is what is revealing. It's peeling back the layers. It is showing us exactly who God is and what He is bringing us. The darkness, John says, cannot overcome it. Cannot overcome it. The light shines in the darkness. In fact, this is the first present tense verb we have in the whole prologue. It, it shines. It didn't shine, shone, whatever the verb would be, past tense, right? No, it shines on. Even yet today, even still, it continues to shine on. Right? The darkness has, has tried to overcome it. We think about the cross. We think about the darkness that came over the earth. We think about that stone that is rolled in front of the grave. But it could not hold Him. The light shines in the darkness. The light is resurrected. The light of the incarnation is the same light of that resurrected Jesus. You see, only a fully divine light, a word from God Himself, could call us and shine on us to give us this new life. I'm going to skip ahead now. I'm going to skip all the way to verse 12. We'll talk about our third word this morning. Our third word is children. And I think this is sort of one of the key pieces to the passage. The passage sort of works down to this and then works back, almost like a staircase. Yet, to all who did receive Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. You see, even in this prologue, even in, in the beginning, the introduction of the Gospel of John, we receive an invitation to this eternal Word and light. Whoever believes in Him, literally, the, the Greek here is whoever, whoever believes into Him. There's this very, very intimate relational sort of union and participation. 
right? It's not just sort of cognitive assent. Oh yeah, I believe in Him. We believe into Him. Are united with Him. He gave the right to be called children of God. See, friends, here's the invitation. This birth has, has changed everything. It's changed the whole world. In fact, John is telling us it changes the cosmos itself. But it also changed your world. It changed my world. You see, something so big and grand and great can be something so personal and so intimate, so directed to us. God not only comes to us in grace as the Word and as the light, but John tells us that he actually brings us back to him. And there's this, there's this sort of ascent, descent motif that runs through the whole prologue that God is coming down to us, what? To bring us back up to him. So how does this rebirth happen? Well, literally, in the prologue, John says, it, it's not by the bloods of mankind. It's not by the crypts either, for that matter. Gang jokes are cool, right? No? No, it's, it's not from any sort of human will or human power or human decision, John says. It has nothing to do with what we are capable of because it is only God that is truly capable of bringing this type of rebirth. He brought all of creation. He brought first birth. But He's also the one who brings rebirth. And this is what F.D. Bruner has beautifully called the deep grace of God for a flawed human race. The deep grace of God for a flawed human race. That God would come down to us. Word and light and life in the form of this helpless child enfleshed, made fully human. So that we too as fully human can become one with God. We can become united with God. We can become His very children. See friends, God's accommodation to us in His nativity, His accommodation to us is not merely toleration of us, it's salvation for us. God's accommodation to us is not merely toleration of us it's salvation for us he became like us to save us and it begins with taking on of flesh you see this is the very beginning of salvation for us it doesn't start on the cross or in the tomb, or in the resurrection, or even in the ascension. It starts here, in the taking on of flesh. Surgeon Richard Seltzer wrote this beautiful reflection. I stand by the bed where a young woman lies, her face post-operative, her mouth twisted in palsy, clownish, tiny twig of the facial nerve the one the muscles to the muscles of her mouth has been severed she will be thus from now on the surgeon had followed with religious fervor the curve of her flesh i promise you that nevertheless to remove the tumor in her cheek i had to cut that little nerve her young husband is in the room he stands on the opposite side of the bed, and together they seem to dwell in the evening lamplight, isolated from me, private. Who are they? I ask myself. He and this wry mouth I have made, who gaze at and touch each other so generously, greedily. The young woman speaks. Will my mouth always be like this? She asks. Yes, I say, it will. It's because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent. But the young man smiles. I like it, he says. It's kind of cute. 
And all at once, I know who He is. I understand. I lower my gaze. One is not bold in an encounter with a God. Unmindful of me, He bends to kiss her crooked mouth. And I am so close that I can see how He twists His own lips to accommodate to hers. To show her that their kiss still works. The kind of love that John tells us in, in this arrestingly and at, at points hauntingly beautiful prologue is just this kind of love. It's an accommodating love. It is an immense descent that He would come down the Creator of the whole universe to accommodate us. Deep grace of God for a flawed human race. See, darkness will never overcome the light. That's the promise of the Christian Gospel. The light will shine on. The light does shine on even today. Even yet still. It shines in the darkness. You know that it's not until verse 17 of 18 in John's prologue that we actually find out that, that this, this word, this life, this light, this sun, this grace, this truth, all of these words that John has used to represent something or someone, we are finally given a name. It's Jesus, the Christ. Right at the end, he leaves that build up. Let me close with a saying from Augustine. I'll paraphrase slightly. In reflecting on this prologue, this beginning of God's, John's Gospel, he says, look, friends, look at how rich he is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Everything belongs to him. Look how rich he is. And then look how poor he became. Because he became flesh and moved in to the neighborhood. Let's pray. Father, it's a mystery so deep we cannot even begin to understand. That the one who was with you before all of creation would come down in the form of a babe, helpless. And yet we know and we believe and we hold out hope that in that very act, becoming flesh, dwelling among us, you began our own salvation. And you invite us even still into the light. Thank you for continuing to shine. Thank you for that offer of light and life. Amen.
must be born for me, for you. Hail, hail the Word made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. This morning we talked about the accommodating love of God. How this accommodating God uh, comes down in the form of a helpless babe. Uh, This is also what we do around the Lord's table. We understand that if we are to become children of God, that God invites us to enter the waters of baptism. To be buried with Him. To repent of our sin. To be raised to walk in new life. This new life is the rebirth of becoming a child of God. And if, if you're born and you need to grow in maturity, if you need to establish your faith and continue to walk in the light, you'll need sustenance. You'll need food. You'll need nourishment in this. Just as God's Word does not go out from His mouth without also not accomplishing, being effective, nourishing not the flowers of the field, but his children, so too this simple meal, uh, this cup and this loaf. They are for us the, the nourishment on the journey that God has given us. It may not be the, the full feast that we await on his second coming when he comes back again, but it is enough. It is sufficient for us to continue on in growing in likeness of him. And so this cup and this loaf represents his body broken for you, his blood poured out for you. And it invites you, receive him, walk in the light. Let's pray. Lord, the simplicity of this meal sometimes can be taken for granted. And yet it's, it's the power and the beauty of the simplicity that reminds us this is what we need. You. Simply you. We thank you for your broken body on that cross. We thank you for your blood poured out as you took our sin to that cross. We thank you that you invite us to become children of you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
Hello, I'm Jonathan Chapman, and I'm the eldest son of George and Eileen Chapman. Dad was the first minister at Park Hill Oak Park, where he served as pastor for over 32 years and as an elder for many years thereafter. I've always considered Oak Park to be my church home and, and its congregation as our extended family. I want to invite you to our 75th anniversary celebration that will be announced in an upcoming message. My friend John Nicholson, who in turn had pastored at Oak Park, says it best that although we might be ministering in different locations, Oak Park is part of our DNA. I grew up in the church, literally. If you look at this picture, you can see my bedroom window where I lived upstairs in the balcony of the church with my folks and two sisters. We were never late for church. We have an incredible past, and Oak Park's history is God's story, as we have the opportunity to learn and recount the many blessings he's provided in Oak Park's ministry throughout the years. At the outset of the Second World War in 1939, Oak Park started as a small Sunday school for children in the Park Hill School. But it wasn't until 1945, when soldiers, including my dad, returned back from the war, that the little Sunday school was revived along with three local women and a couple of Bible college students who met in a tent. Construction began on our first building in 1947 with the help of my dad, and my grandpa, Harry Chapman, along with other men from congregations, the college, and the community. I, in turn, had the pleasure of working with my dad and so many others in the purchase, planning, and construction of Oak Park in Cedar Bray, and also served in that leadership for over 30 years. Then I had the further blessing of working with my son, John, in the addition to our sanctuary, our classrooms, and the fireside room. Over four generations, all working at different times in different places. I am so looking forward to our get together when the time is right to celebrate 75 years of faithful ministry.